Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, so uh, my name's Mark Bull. I'm a senior researcher at EPCC um, and I'm going to be running today's sessions. So first up this morning is going to be going to be talking about uh, OpenMP performance. So the same, same as yesterday, uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go, in, go along, uh, either just shout out or, uh, or type in the chat window. I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to keep my eye, eye on the chat and, uh, uh, and answer anything that comes up. Okay, um, so can I ask you just actually, just before, before I start, um, how many of you, or whether, uh, <laughs> get everybody to respond, uh, are, you, are you familiar with OpenMP? Have you done op OpenMP uh, coding? Okay, great. So it looks as though most people have, uh, are either familiar with OpenMP or they've at least, uh, they've at least done, done a little bit or, or, or seen some. So uh, hopefully I um, don't have to explain too much about, about the basics before uh, 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 as we go along. Okay, so uh, OpenMP is nice in the sense that it's quite, you know, it's in some sense quite easy to write, um, but getting, getting good performance can actually be quite tricky. There's a lot that can go wrong. Um, so it's very easy, particularly when we're starting out with OpenMP to get into this kind of situation. Okay, so you, you, you wrote your parallel program with OpenMP, you checked it gives the right answers, uh, and then you ran some timing tests to check the performance, and well, the speed up was a bit disappointing. Okay, now what do you do? Okay, um, so most of us have probably, probably been here or, or will be there if you, if you start developing OpenMP. Um, so, uh, question is, you know, what, what happened to my performance? Where did my performance go? Well, the way I like to think about it is that it disappeared into overheads of some sort. Okay, and um, I'm, what I'm, the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to talk about the different sorts of overheads that can come up with OpenMP programs uh, and some potential ways that you can you can work on them and fix them. So I'm going to talk about the, the six and a half evils. Okay, so there, uh, if you sort of classify these sources of overhead, you can come up with, uh, with some different categories uh, and uh, really sort of fall into about, about six different categories. So your problems can be due to sequential code, idle threads, synchronization, scheduling costs, communication, or hardware resource contention. And we'll talk about each of those in, in, in turn. Uh, what's the extra half? Well, there's another minor one, which is, which is compiler non-optimization. And I, I'll mention that as well at, uh, at, at the end. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start at the beginning and take a look at these uh, and talk about ways of, ways of avoiding them. Okay, so first up is sequential code. Okay. Um, so uh, to remember that in OpenMP, all the code that's outside of parallel regions or code that's in uh, constructs that only involve one thread like master or single, that's, that's sequential code. Okay. And the time that's, that's spent in sequential code is obviously going to limit, limit your performance. It's just a simple Amdahl's law type argument. Okay. So for example, you know, if I, uh, if, um, of code that uh, in the original sequential code takes 20% of the execution time, and I don't parallelize that bit, then I'm never going to get more than more than five times speed up, no matter how many threads I use. Okay, so in some sense, this is this is an easy one to understand, and the fix has to be well. Okay, I'm you know I haven't finished my job, right? There's there's still sequential code there, uh, and you. You, in order to get more performance, you're going to find need to find more some way of some way of parallelizing it. 
Okay, there may be because uh, there may be strong reasons why it's sequential. Okay, so it may not may actually be some code that's not parallelizable uh, for some reason. You know, there are uh, it's a it's a sequential algorithm with with dependencies that doesn't parallelize nicely. In that case, you're going to maybe have to go away and, uh, and rethink uh, algorithm at the algorithmic level uh, rather than just at the code level. Okay, so second possible cause of overheads is due to idle threads. Okay, and typically this is where we have some threads uh, finish a piece of computation before others and have to wait others to catch up. So uh, classically, you know, this is uh, this is load imbalance. Okay? So different threads have different different amounts of work to do. And in OpenMP, probably the most common situation is to find threads sitting idle in a barrier at the end of a parallel loop or a parallel region. So uh, OpenMP is, uh, the way OpenMP is designed is that it's full of implicit barriers. So there are these you know, full synchronization points across all the threads every time we come to the end of a parallel region uh, or end of a parallel loop unless we put a, a, a no wait directive on, on, on the loop. Oh, sorry, no wait clause on the, on the parallel loop directive. Um, so you, know, you can very often find, so if uh, not every thread has the same amount of work to do, then uh, okay, you get situations like this. Uh, um, so this is supposed to show uh, thread, this is supposed to show thread activity over time. So time, time running left to right, uh, I've got four threads here. And the blue part is, is uh, supposed to represent them doing actual work. Uh, and then the red part is time where they're spending idle. So in this case, uh, the third thread takes the longest. So all the other threads have to wait uh, until the third thread reaches, reaches the barrier, uh, at which point they can, they can all continue. Okay, so how how do you uh, how do you avoid a load imbalance? Well, if it's a parallel loop, then OpenMP gives us a lot of uh, a lot of choices. So we can experiment with with different schedule kinds and chunk sizes. So we can use uh, you know, static with a chunk size, or dynamic, or guided schedules. Um, and there's a uh, there's a convenience uh, that you can. If you if you specify schedule runtime in the code, then you can set you can set the scheduled kind and the chunk size as an environment variable. So it allow, it's a, just a convenience which allows you to to experiment with with different loop schedules without doing any any recompilation. If you have very irregular computations, then using OpenMP tasks can be helpful. Uh, so the run the runtime take takes care of the load balancing. So in particular, this this uh, uh, might happen if you have a sort of um, if you have nested parallelism and you have load imbalance at both level both levels of the nesting, um, then you know dealing with that is uh, with just parallel loops can be can be very difficult. Um, where using using nested tasks uh, can, can be a solution in, in that kind of case where you have these these very irregular uh, very irregular types of types of computation. So in that case, the runtime is supposed to take care of the load balancing. Okay, so whenever we create open M uh, tasks in OpenMP, they are available for execution by all of the threads in the parallel region, and the runtime will do its best to to, to balance the load for you. And just kind of a, a, a warning is that it's not necessarily always safe to assume that two threads doing the same number of computations will actually take the same time to execute them. Um, why is that? Well, it's because the, the time that, it, that a thread takes to load and store data may be different because that depends on if and where that data is, is cached. So you know, if you have uh, two threads, they're both accessing an array, and all of the array happens you know, at the start of the loop, 
all the all the array happens to be in the uh, you know has valid copies are, are all in a in level one cache uh, or where one of the threads is executing, then the the thread that's uh, the thread with that cache that's running next to that cache on the core next to that cache will get all cache cache hits, uh, whereas the other thread will get all cache misses. So you can get load imbalance. Uh, coming from different co different memory access costs, uh, as well as different amounts, as well as executing different numbers and instructions. And you can also get idle threads uh, at critical sections. So uh, critical section is a piece of code where we only allow one thread at a time to execute it. So that can, so waiting for access to that critical section uh, can happen if there's, if there's contention for it. So in OpenMP, uh, so critical regions, uh, atomics or, or lock routines can, can all cause this. So in this, uh, in this case, for example, we have this, uh, this block of code with the, the green stripy thing is, is our critical section, which, which only uh, only one time, one thread at a time is is allowed to execute. So uh, uh, if all the threads say happen to arrive at that at that point at, at roughly the same time, then one thread will get in. In this case, it's the first thread gets in and executes the the critical section. Then once it exits, it allows then another thread, and this is the second thread gets it next, and then the third thread, and then the fourth thread. Um, but these uh, apart from the first thread here, all the other threads have some have some idle time while they're waiting to to to, act, to, to get into the into the critical section. So what can we do to avoid waiting? Let's try to well, first thing we can do is try to minimize the actual time spent in the critical section. And so think about you know, so if, if you if you need a critical section, think about can I uh, can I absolutely minimize the amount of code that needs to go in there? You just to remember that uh, open, OpenMP critical regions are in fact uh, uh, essentially a global lock. Okay, so all the threads have to uh, any thread that wants to go into a critical OpenMP critical region has to acquire this lock. Um, so, but you you are allowed to use critical directives with with different names. So, if you have more than one data structure that you need to protect inside a parallel region or a parallel loop, uh, it's possible to do that separately with with differently named critical regions. Um, if possible, it's almost always going to be worth using atomics rather than critical sections if you can. Okay, so use of atomics is, is restricted. It has to be a single update. Uh, and the thing that you're updating on the left-hand side has to be, uh, has to be something of, of, of basic type. Um, so it can be an array element, um, but it, uh, it, it, can't be, it can't be a, uh, a derived data type or, or anything like that. Okay. So it has to be a, uh, you know, an integer or floating point value or some or or something like that, and a basic type in the underlying language and the underlying language. So atomics are as uh, they're they're both uh, they both have, the atomics tend to have lower overhead than critical regions, but they also allow more optimization. So in particular, if you are uh, if you have to protect accesses updates to array elements. Then using by using atomics, uh, the uh, the runtime is able to to protect different array elements separately, so that it uh, you you can allow uh, updates to different array elements to happen concurrently with atomics, whereas that with whereas that can't happen if you if you use a critical region. And then sometimes that's not possible uh, because what you're doing, maybe what you're doing is not just a simple update. Uh, it's not a one, it's not a, not a, a, a one line increment to, uh, or change to, to, a, to, a, to a basic type. 
Uh, so you might have to use use lock routines, um, and then you can obviously use multiple locks. So if you have lots of you know, have a whole collection of data structures, maybe you have you know a large array of of, of objects or structures, say representing. Um, so a classical case would be where you have uh, for particle codes. Okay, we have some some structure representing a particle, uh, and that sometimes you need to have uh, you know, need to do, uh, access one thread at a time to to update a particle. Then yeah, you might want to use multiple locks, and for example, associate one lock uh, one lock variable with every with every particle, um, and you can actually include it in the in the object or the data structure for for convenience. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay, great. So next one I want to talk about is, is synchronization. Okay because every time we synchronize threads, the, there is some overhead, even if the threads are never idle, okay? Because uh, in order to synchronize, the threads must, must communicate somehow. So this, the, there are, there's something going on in the memory system. So at some, you know, some level, it's all down. It's, you know, all, all synchronization is really just, just memory accesses of some sort, okay? So maybe special types of memory accesses, but, it, but it's still all memory accesses uh, at the bottom level. Um, so uh, you know, every time we execute a barrier, for example, even if all the threads arrive at the barrier at exactly the same time, it takes a certain amount of time for the barrier to actually execute before the threads can, can proceed afterwards. And as I said before, you know, the way OpenMP is, is, is designed that you know it's very easy to end up with with codes which are which are full of implicit barriers so every every parallel region every parallel loop has this barrier at the end and barriers can be surprisingly expensive uh, so the cost you know, will depend on the number of threads you know, which openmp runtime you're using uh, what hardware you're running on um, but you know typically you can think of it in this sort of you know it's in the order of uh, thousands to tens of thousands of clock cycles. So that no, you know, so on, on most hardware, that's going to translate to order of you know a, a few to a few tens of microseconds to execute a barrier. Okay. So if the amount of work in, in inside the parallel inside your parallel loop or your parallel region um, you know, takes of that order of amount of time, then you can easily get into a situation where the where the overheads of the of, of the barrier will will completely dominate. Um, and then you know other types of synchronization aren't free either. So you know every just uh, every time we enter or exit a critical section or do an atomic or acquire or release a lock, uh, even if there's no contention, so even if even if the uh, if the encountering thread doesn't have to wait, then there's still some cost of, of, of actually doing it. Uh, and that's also true about tasks as well. So every time you create and execute an OpenMP task, there's, there's, there's some synchronization going over, or go overhead going on as well. Okay. So what can we do to try and, try and avoid synchronization overheads? Well, we can think about trying to parallelize at the, at the outermost possible level. Okay, so it's particularly if you think about um, you've got maybe uh, uh, a nested structure of loops yeah, in your code. It's, very, it's a very common pattern. Um, not, all, not all applications are like that, but, but uh, a lot of them are, are. So think about trying to parallelize at the outermost possible level to try and minimize the, the frequency of, of, of barriers being executed. So that might require you to do some reordering of loops and that in turn might also imply a reordering of array indices to keep your, your memory access patterns cache friendly. So that's something we'll talk about later on today. Um, so uh, that may not be, a, uh, it certainly may not be a trivial change to the code. 
So as I mentioned before, it's possible to suppress the implicit barrier at the end of a loop, of end of a parallel loop uh, with a no weight clause. Um, so uh, you can do that, but clearly you have to be really careful. It's, it's, all, it's all too easy to, to introduce race conditions by, by removing barriers that are actually needed for, for correctness. Um, but, it, but it is possible to do that. And yes, typically I say, say him, atomics may have less, less overhead than critical or locks. Um, so th th there's, nothing that's, there's nothing in the OpenMP specification that says they do, but typically they do. Okay, it is a quality of implementation problem, but uh, in most uh, in most OpenMP implementations, uh, using using atomics is uh, is, is certainly uh, has less less overhead than, than critical or locks. Okay, um, next one is scheduling. So. In OpenMP, where whenever we create computational tasks and we're relying on the runtime to assign these to threads, then we're going to incur some overheads in the runtime for that process. Um, and some of that might actually be internal synchronization in, in the runtime. Okay, so there's kind of a slight overlap here between, between scheduling and, and, and synchronization. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's probably useful to think about them, them separately. So the examples where this, this, this comes up, uh, you know, is uh, the uh, loop schedules, which are not static, okay, and also task constructs. So in this case, we're, uh, you know, specifying uh, what's parallel, okay? So we're saying, okay, loop iterations are parallel or tasks are parallel, can be executed concurrently. But uh, but we're not specifying which thread does what. Okay, so we're leaving that up to up to the runtime to to sort out uh, in order to try and get uh, typically in order to try and get good load balance. Okay, um, but if I you know if I do something like this you know so if I have you know uh, a loop with with an awful lot of iterations and the amount of work inside the inside the loop is 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 really small. And I try to do schedule dynamic with a chunk size of one so that every single iteration has to be uh, dynamically scheduled to a thread, then uh, that's probably not going to end well. Okay, that's, uh, that, that's probably going to, to end, end up with, uh, with a, pile of over, a pile of scheduling overheads uh, and you won't get good performance. So really the trick here you need to think about is, is getting the granularity of these tasks right, okay? So if we're specifying computational tasks um, then and getting the runtime to schedule them, then we've got to think about you know, get the task granularity right. If the tasks are too big, then there won't be enough of them to keep all our threads busy at the same time. Okay, so we're going to get idle threads overheads. If the tasks are too small, then we can end up in, in, have, in drowning in scheduling overheads. So we normally have to think about if we're, if we're doing this dynamic, dynamic style of programming, normally have to think about uh, controlling the, the task granularity. There'll normally be some, um, some sweet spot, some, some good value of granularity where we get the best performance. Um, so yeah, just getting this trade-off right between not enough tasks to keep the threads busy and too many tiny tasks where we're just going to, to, to drown in scheduling overheads. Okay, any questions on that bit? So Andrew asks, is the task size is to be found by trial and error? <laughs> Typically, yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can, um, 
again, you can have some idea of uh, of what what's a reasonable task, and it's uh, it's probably again in the order of uh, microseconds, tens of microseconds, something like that. Okay, if uh, if your tasks are smaller than that, then you're almost cert almost certainly in trouble. Um, but yeah, um, it's it's typically found by trial and error, and it, it's useful to. And of course, it may depend on your program inputs as well, uh, and it'll depend on how many threads you're running. So so it's uh, it's it's hard to you know find find a fixed value. Um, but what you can do is. Um, is try okay uh, to to parameterize your your task granularity in some in some way okay so make it make it easy for the program to ch to change the granularity um, so that also depends on so that might be as simple as just you know allowing a choice of uh, a, a choice of chunk size um, there's a trick you can do if it with especially with loop schedules actually which is rather than setting the chunk size is to fix the number of chunks per thread and then derive the chunk size in that because that's actually more uh, that's the, the number of number of chunks per thread is actually a tends to be a more robust parameter again you know it, it uh, the optimal value will vary much less with the number of threads than, than the actual chunk size, so, so that's one trick you can play. Um, but in general, you know, finding a way to to parameterize the the granularity of your tasks so that it makes it easy to, well, both easy to experiment uh, and also easy to you know easy to have under under user control if if necessary. So Liam asks, is schedule auto ever the right choice here? Um, it's another one to try. Um, in practice, uh, most depends what the implementation actually does with schedule auto. Some some implementations do do, do something really dull, and they basically just say oh, they just do schedule guided instead of auto. Okay, so they really don't do anything useful. Uh, some implementations will use auto to implement a different loop scheduling algorithm. So something like affinity scheduling, for example, uh, in which case it it, uh, it it might be uh, it might be useful. Okay, it might might turn out to perform better than the than than any of the uh, the op the oh, the OpenMP specified options. Um, but it's kind of a bit you know unfortunately kind of leaving it in your code is a bit risky because you know if you move from one comp compiler to another, um, you've really not much idea what it's what it's going to do. Okay, so let's move on and talk about communication. And, and in many ways, this is the difficult one. Okay, or the you know the the hardest one to to deal with of the of, of the six evils. Why is that? Well, it's because on on shared memory memory systems, in in some sense, communication is is disguised uh, as increased memory access costs. Uh, because whenever threads need to exchange values with each other. Um, they're they're doing it through the memory system, and it takes longer to access that da data that's in main memory or in another core's cache than it does to get it from from the local cache on uh, the, where the, where the thread is running. Okay, and have to remember that you know as we saw yesterday, memory access is exp uh, are, are expensive. You know it's you know order of one or two hundred cycles uh, for a main memory access. You know compared to a handful of a handful of cycles for a floating point operation. Okay, and in shared memory programs like OpenMP, the communication between the processes is actually taking place via the cache coherency mechanism. Okay, and uh, you know, it's very different from message passing because you know, if we write an MPI program, then we know exactly where the communication is happening. The only place communication ever happens in MPI is inside calls to the MPI library. 
Um, uh, and so that makes it, you know, it's, it's, it's then obvious when we're looking at an MPI program where the communication is happening. And it also makes it possible to, uh, for tools to monitor it quite easily. And so uh, profiling tools can, can instrument the, uh, the MPI library, intercept the MPI calls, and you can get all sorts of information about you know, how long messages took to, to, to send and receive and how many bytes were transferred and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but in shared memory programs, this communication is just memory accesses. It's just loads and stores. Uh, so that means it's, it's very fine grained uh, and it's spread throughout the program. And just by looking at an OpenMP program, you can't tell easily which memory accesses are going to result in inter-thread communications. Um, and the fine grainedness also makes it difficult for tools to instrument it as well. I mean, you can do a, you can do a certain, you know, there are tools that will do a certain amount. You can get a certain amount from, uh, you know, you can get some indications of cache miss rates from, from hardware counters. Um, there, are other, there are some tools that will do something a bit better than that. Um, but you know, in, in general, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult for tools to instrument because the overhead of instrumenting every single memory access is just uh, uh, is, is not is really not feasible. Okay, so cache coherency in a nutshell. Okay, so so cache coherence is a complicated thing. Um, so this is the process by you know by which the hardware makes sure that uh, uh, if uh, two different threads read the same memory address, then uh, then they're going to see the same value, okay? Regardless of uh, of whether co of where copies of that address are being are being stored in in all the different caches in the system. Okay, so so kind of um, say the the real mechanisms are very complicated. But as programmers, it's it's okay to have a pretty uh, you know a, a very high level and simplistic view of it. That that's enough to reason about reason about what's going on and 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 how to avoid it. Okay, so this is the 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 basic idea is that well, whenever a thread write, it writes a data item, it's going to get uh, an exclusive copy of that data in its local cache. Okay, so that will the, the the copy in its local cache will be the latest will have the latest value and will be the will essentially be the uh, will will be the up to date copy of, of the data at that memory address. And when that happens, when a thread writes something, all the other copies in of that data item in any other caches will be invalidated. Uh, so that you know, so that other threads are are not able to read out of date values, and then subsequent accesses to that data item. So once it's been read, once it's been written by one thread, you know, other threads trying to read or write that data item must get that data from from wherever the exclusive copy lives. Okay, uh, and that and that's what takes the time because that requires moving data from from one cache to another. Well, actually, the invalidation process also takes a certain amount of time as well. Okay, so if you do a write and there are other copies in 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 the system somewhere in other caches, then then that write that write takes longer to complete uh, in order to do the invalidations. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, so that's but that's a, a very you know that is uh, just just. Be aware that that's a very simplified description of what's going on. The actual, the, the real details of what's happening in the hardware are, are, are really very complicated. So what are the consequences of this for our, for our programs, uh, OpenMP programs, okay? Well, it's, it's really all about data affinity, okay? So you know, the data will be cached on the processes which are accessing it, okay? Uh, that's what caches do. So, uh, you know, it's just, this is just an extension of the idea that we must reuse cache data as much as possible. So 
we need to write, try and write code with good data affinity. What does that mean? We need to try and ensure that the same thread accesses the same subset of program data as, as much as possible. Okay, so even though, you know, so we, at, at first sight, you know, shared memory programming is nice because, you know, one of the reasons shared programming is nice because it gets, you know, it, it, it's absol it seems to absolve us from, from the need to think about data distribution. Okay. But if we completely ignore data distribution, if we completely ignore the concept of you know, which thread is accessing which data, then we can end up uh, doing a lot of inter-thread communication. So you know, although we don't have to deal with it uh, you know, precisely and very in, you know, we don't have to absolutely do data decompositions in the same way as we have to do with MPI programs, we still need to think a little bit about you know, which, which threads are, are accessing what data. And for reasons I'll come on to, okay, it's, it's best that those subsets are, are reasonably large contiguous chunks of data as well. Okay, so I'm thinking not just at the, not just at the individual word level. Another consequence is a, sort of a bit of an aside, but you know, this is also why it's important that we have to prevent threads migrating between cores while the code is running. Okay. Because what happens if a, you know, if a thread moves from one core to the core to another, it means that it's basically left all its cache data behind and it has to drag it with it. And that's, that's expensive. Okay. So the actual cost of, I mean, there's a cost of, Doing, doing the move uh, in the first place, but uh, but then the, there's also this consequence that uh, that the threads data will all be cached in the wrong place, uh, and we'll have to gradually migrate to the the cache on the on the core where where the data where the thread has moved to. Okay, so in general, you can do something. You know, you have to do something to do with uh, um, binding your threads to cores. Say um, on. Systems like Archer 2, then Slurm is effectively taking care of that for you, or at least some com some rather messy com messy combination of Slurm and the OpenMP runtime is is doing that for you. Okay. Uh, in more more general cases, you know, on, on other systems, you can use uh, environment variable OMP prop bind, uh, set that to true, and that says, you know, please runtime. You know, Fix my fix my threads to cores and, uh, and don't move them around. Okay, um, so right here, here's an example where of uh, where where data affinity can can go wrong. Um, so uh, there are a couple of loop nests here. And I want to focus on the second one first. Okay, uh, so so we'll look at what's going. So we've got a, a doubly nested loop, and which makes accesses into this array A. So that's what that's that's this is the memory accesses I want to want to focus on. And you'll see that this is uh, the loop is so runs uh, i is zero i less than n. But the bounds on j are j equals zero, j less than i. Okay, so that means if I uh, if I use an OpenMP directive to parallelize the i loop, then that's uh, that will not be well well load balanced because different values have, of of i uh, will do different numbers of of j iterations. So I, I need to do something, uh, you know, and so. I uh, need to do something to take care of the load balance. And that might mean choosing a, a suitable schedule. So I might do some experiments with this loop and I say, okay, schedule, you know, static schedule with a chunk size of 16, maybe turns out to be a, uh, a good solution for, for, uh, for this loop. Okay. But then let's look back and see where this array A was was last written, okay, and it's in in this loop here, okay. Um, but this loop has uh, has rectangular bounds, okay. So this is i less than n and j less than n as well, 
Okay, so in this for this loop, there's no reason to to do any load balancing. Okay, it's already it's already well load balanced. So we can just use use schedule static to do a uh, a simple division, simple block division of the of the I iterations across threads. But what this, but the implications now are that the the threads which acts, you know, if you think of it, a particular value of i and j, for the most part, the thread which accesses a i j in this loop is will be because of the different schedule will be a different thread that that wrote it down here. Okay. So that means that almost all these accesses to AIJ are going to result in cache misses um, because this, you know, the, the data will be, will, the elements of AIJ will be cached on the, uh, on the cores where, where the threads are running in this loop. And then when we come to access them again, they're in the wrong place. So, Okay, the different AM, different accesses pattern way was going to result in, in a lot of communication in a case like this. This case, well, there's an easy fix. Okay, we could just apply uh, applying the same uh, schedule to the first loop. So if we did static 16 on the first loop, then we would get the same access pattern into the into the array A in, in both the loops, and that would fix the problem, and it should have. I would expect that to have minimal impact on the on the performance of the first loop. Okay, it's still a static schedule. The fact we're doing doing chunk sizes of sixteen should should make very little difference. Okay, and here's here's another example. Okay, so suppose we have a uh, a parallel loop and each loop iteration reads from an array element AI. Okay. Uh, and then we have, uh, so suppose this loop, the body of this loop does, does a lot more other computation as well. So it's reasonably expensive. So we decide, okay, this is worth, um, this is worth parallelizing. Uh, and then we have a little loop here that just sets the array elements back to, to, to some other value. Okay, and might turn out well. Okay, we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't bothered to parallelize this because it doesn't take very much time in the sequential code. Okay, uh, and then after that, we execute the first loop again. Okay. Um, so we're going to say, think again. What's going to happen to the elements of AI? Okay, so as they are read by different threads, then different bits of the array. Will be will be cached in different caches. Okay, so we'll get uh, get copies in different caches, and then when we do this write here, that will invalidate all those copies, and we'll get an exclusive copy of a in the in the cache where this thread where the master thread is executing, uh, and then when we come to access them again here then uh, again, these are this is going to result in uh, a lot of cache misses because again, apart from thread zero, uh, the, the data is all in the wrong, is now going to the exclusive copy, the up-to-date copy of, of AI is all in the wrong place. Um, so again, no simple solutions. Maybe you can just parallelize this. Uh, maybe an even better solution might be to say merge this into one or other of these loops. Okay, so um, you know, do it at the do it at, if you can. You know, do it at the start or the end of end of uh, at the end of this loop or the start of this one. Not always possible. Depends on the data access patterns. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think I've probably said all this. Yeah. So yeah, the sequential code will actually take longer. With multiple threads, so that's kind of a weird thing. You can sometimes see that, you know, if you've got uh, doing timing or profiling, you can actually see cases where you know, the uh, a piece of sequential code uh, takes longer when you've got parallel regions with more than one thread somewhere else. So it's kind of a, quite a weird effect. You think, why on earth's going on here? Okay, I'm not. There's no parallelism here. How can how can uh, how can threading change the uh, 
uh, how can multi-threading change the performance of this piece of sequential code? Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is a reason why that might happen. And you'll also see, okay, yeah, the second parallel region is going to scale badly because of the additional ca cache misses. So Andrew asks, can private variables be used more often to better control communications? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, so um, you can use pri you know, private variables. Clearly, you can only uh, can only be accessed by the by owning thread. So they're not going to be communicated. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, that's you know that. It's a, that's only just subject to, to, to whether you can make a correct code, okay? And in, and in most cases, you probably can't, okay? Um, so making local copies, making temporary copies into private variables might help in some cases, uh, though then you also have to worry about you know, the, the cost of making the copies and the extra memory that you're using. So the answer is, Maybe, but it's not a not a very commonly used tactic. Okay, and next up, okay, it gets worse. Okay, uh, and it gets worse in a couple of ways. One of these is is numer effects. Okay. So we have a um, multi-socket systems. The you know the location of data in main memory is actually important, okay? Because we have this uh, we don't have actually one physical piece of main memory. Main memory gets gets split up, and as we saw yesterday, in fact, you know this is now happening. Uh, we're now getting numer regions uh, in single in within a socket as well, okay? So that's true on true on Archer too. So uh, on Arch2, we've got two, two sockets in the node, okay, each with a 64 core chip in it. But each of those, each of those chips actually has four separate NUMA regions attached to it. So every set of 16 cores has a physically separate piece of memory. Okay, so it's still a single address space across the whole memory in the node. But it's actually they're, they're they're actually physically distinct pieces of memory uh, for every for every sixteen cores. Okay, so it matters. You know, where does your data where does your data get allocated? Which NUMA region is my data allocated on? That matters. Okay, uh, and OpenMP doesn't give you any support for controlling that. Okay. Um, and the you know, the usual way that it's done is that, uh, you know, particularly for uh, HPC systems, so in fact anything running Linux really, um, the default policy for the operating system is to place the data, okay, on the processor where that means you know in the in the NUMA region attached to the core that first accesses it. Okay, so this is so-called first touch policy. Okay, so wherever that that data is first accessed in the application, the uh, the OS will try to place it in the NUMA region closest to where that access came from. Uh, so obviously it can't, you know, if if that's if that's already full, then okay, it will go somewhere else. Um, but that's what it'll that that's what it'll try to do um, by default. Okay. Um, and say for for MPI programs, that makes total sense. Okay, so you know, uh, for MPI rank is running on a core, all the data that it that it accesses will be the uh, will be typically allocated in the NUMA region attached to that core. So everything's everything's good. Okay. Unfortunately, for OpenMP programs, this can be the this can actually be a pathologically bad problem. Uh, so this policy actually is is actually a bad thing for OpenMP programs, because particularly if you know if the if your data happens to be initialized by the master thread. Okay, so if your data initialization is sequential, 
it's all going to get allocated or may all be allocated in one NUMA region. And then having all your threads running on other cores, accessing data in the same socket or same new region will become a bottleneck. So uh, there is some additional memory latency to go across different NUMA regions, um, but that's not the real problem typically. The real problem is that you are limiting the available memory bandwidth. Okay? So if, if all your data, if you have say, you know, if I have one socket, 64 core socket, um, and all of the data is on one NUMA region, then basically I am basically sort of restricting, I'm, I'm only able to use a quarter uh, of the available memory bandwidth on, a, uh, on, on an AMD ROM. Okay, what can you do? Okay, uh, well, you can, you can change the, the, uh, that policy. Okay, um, so in Linux, the NUMA CTL command uh, allows you to change the policy from first touch to something else uh, like round robin, where it just cycles pages around the different NUMA regions. Typically not a great solution, okay? Might, might help avoid the worst pathological cases, but that might not be a great solution. Typically what we need to do is to actually use the first touch policy to control the data placement indirectly and do that by actually parallelizing your data initialization. Okay, so even though that, that might seem completely not worthwhile in view of the insignificant time it takes in your sequential code, you know, you might be, uh, you know, typically you're going to have long running jobs where, you know, the data initialization takes a couple of seconds and your job's going to run for 48 hours. Okay, so why why bother why bother parallelizing the data initialize the, the initialization at the beginning? Well, it's uh, it helps you get this the, the placement right. Okay. You don't have to get it exactly right, and you know for many applications there isn't necessarily an optimal you know there isn't necessarily an optimal solution. Um, but essentially, you know, some distribution is usually much better than none at all because you know, that that helps us not throw away all the all, all the available bandwidth. Um, so, you know, again, very much depends on the application. You know, if your main data structures are large multi-dimensional arrays, then initializing them in in, in parallel is, is is pretty trivial. If your data structures are you know organically growing tree structures or graphs um, then you know, it can be it can be a whole whole bunch more difficult to do um, and then you just have to say okay remember that the allocation is actually being done okay the units in which this the OS is allocating memory to uh, to numa nodes is, is OS pages so that's typically in you know, order of kilobytes size so I just have to remember that when you're when you're doing the distribution. And okay, it's also a reason maybe why you, it's, it's a possible reason not to use large pages. So Liam says, yeah, okay, I should, should, should really have made this point right now. Yeah, okay. So Liam says, it's hard to solve with OpenMP alone. Normally recommend OpenMP within new regions and MPI between them. Yes, absolutely, okay. Um, almost, almost always, if we're doing hybrid MPI and OpenMP, then uh, using at least one MPI process per NUMA region is, is going to be the good solution. It's very difficult to get the OpenMP in, in general. It's, uh, it's very unusual that, that OpenMP will, will scale sufficiently well outside of a NUMA region uh, to make using so on. On Archer 2, that would mean, you know, it would be very un, unusual that using fewer than eight MPI processes per node will, will be the optimum solution. It can happen, but it but it but it's but it's uh, uh, it, it's rare. And in fact, in practice, uh, actually, you know, um, four or eight threads per per MPI rank is 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 typically the, uh, the 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 sweet spot for for hybrid applications.
Okay, so that's bad. Um, and the next, this one is, is um, well, it, it used to be even worse. Uh, modern hardware has gone some way to alleviating this problem um, by the, the the design of the of, of caches and the, and the way that they're connected together. Um, but nevertheless, it, it, it still can, can still happen, and you still need to be aware of it. Okay, and this is false sharing. Okay, so remember we talked about the the way that the um, cache coherency mechanism is what is basically what's happening when we communicate between threads. But the units of data that are being transferred between caches are a cache cache blocks or cache lines. Uh, and these are typically, uh, you know, of, of the order of maybe 64 or 128 bytes. Okay. Um, so on, on Archer 2, they're all, all the caches are, are, have 64 byte lines. So, but that's always going to be bigger than a word. Okay. So, uh, you know, words of data will be, depending on whether they're floats or doubles or ints or whatever, they're typically going to be four or eight bytes. So that means that if we have different threads writing to neighboring words in memory, that's still going to cause cache invalidations. Okay, so even, even though threads are logically writing to, to different memory locations, if they happen to be close enough to lie in the same cache block, then that's still going to trigger the, the cache coherency mechanism. Um, and you know, it's still a problem, even if even if it's just one thread writing and, and the others reading. Okay? If all threads are reading, it's fine. Okay? Every thread just gets their own copy and, and sticks with it because nothing ever gets invalidated. But as, as, uh, as soon as there's at least one writer, then, then that's going to trigger, trigger invalidations. So you know, the, the worst cases usually occur where you have different threads repeatedly writing neighboring array elements. Um, so, you know, patterns like this should uh, uh, should ring, a, ring an alarm bell. OK, so basically, if you know, if I have some shared array that uh, where I want to you know, count something for every thread, for example. OK, so I use my thread number to index into a shared array and, and increment it. So that means that, you know, for sure, you know, different threads are accessing neighboring elements in the array. Uh, which will, uh, and those neighboring elements are going to lie on, on the same cache block. Okay. So, you know, if you, if you, if this is frequent enough, then this will, this will cause problems. So another situation where you could see it is, um, is, is basically this. Um, so uh, this same loop again, it's actually the same loop as we looked at earlier. Okay. So, uh, but this time what matters is the, the array that's been written which is, is B here, okay? And so in this case, you know, because we've got an unbalanced loop, you might decide to use a, uh, a static schedule with a small chunk size, say one here, okay? But that means that uh, neighboring values of I will be executed by different threads. Uh, and so that means that neighboring values of B will also be written by uh, by, by different threads. Um, so sometimes you can see this problem happening in, in, uh, in situations like this. Um, and essentially what you will find is that if you, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you change the chunk size, if you make the chunk size bigger, then even though that would, have, you know, that would seem to say, okay, well, that's actually going to make the load balance worse. Then, uh, once the chunks get big enough that, uh, that threads are accessing different cache blocks in, in B, then, then the performance actually improves. So the you know a chunk size of one for a loop like this is, is probably not going to be optimal uh, because of this effect. Okay, any more questions about the communication stuff?
Okay, so on to evil six, which is hardware resource contention. Okay, um, so you know the design of all our hardware is you know is 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 a cost versus performance trade offs. Okay, but there are, there are shared resources which, if all the cores try to access them at the same time, don't scale. Uh, or you can think of it another way. You know, an application running on a single core can access more than its fair share of resources. Uh, and in particular, the, you know, what we're uh, considering here is cores, and therefore the OpenMP threads that are running on them can contend for memory bandwidth. That's probably the biggest, the biggest deal. They can contend for cache capacity, okay, in, in shared caches. So remember that on, on Arch 2, every set of four cores shares a level three cache. Um, so if we have, if we just have one thread running, then it can access all 16 megabytes of that L3 cache. But if we have four threads running on those four cores, then essentially effectively each, each thread only gets four megabytes of, of L3. Uh, and also you can contend for functional units if you're using simultaneous multi-threading. Okay, so if you're running so using hardware threads, running more than one thread per, per physical core, um, then they can contend for the, uh, say, particularly for, for floating point units. Um, and you can see that, you know, if you are, uh, if, if you're running something like, if something that's very floating point intensive, so dense matrix matrix multiplies, for example, which are completely hammering the, the, the floating point units, then uh, you know using uh, there's one reason why why using hardware threads won't help okay because you're already one one thread on the on the core is already maxing out the the floating point units and uh, uh, and using a second one isn't going to help okay so memory bandwidth is probably the big deal uh, you know codes which are very bandwidth hungry will not linearly will not scale linearly on most shared memory hardware. Uh, what can we do about that? Well, really the only thing is we can uh, try to reduce the bandwidth demands by improving locality and, and hence uh, re the reuse of data in, in caches. And, and that should also benefit our sequential performance as well, um, but it's particularly important for, for parallel codes. Uh, and obviously this applies to, you know, this, is, this isn't just restricted to, to OpenMP, this is, this, this is important for, uh, uh, for MPI codes as well. Okay. And in, a, in some cases, it, it's actually worth trading off additional computations to reduce the memory bandwidth costs. So it's, uh, it's you know, it sometimes is worth computing something twice rather than storing it and reloading it from memory. If that's going to, you know, if it's if the data structure is too big to fit in to fit in the cache, then uh, then basically recomputing can be um, can be uh, beneficial uh, to to reduce your memory bandwidth uh, demands. Um, so code I was working on recently, where which was a, a, a was an unusual but a really spectacular example of that. Uh, to so able to 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 restructure the code so that uh, uh, you know, essentially it, uh, it we did some recomputation of of values instead of storing it in in big arrays and reading it back in again uh, and also doing things like uh, you know, it was it was basically you know, it had routines which were you know computing two um, two two one dimensional arrays and then after that doing uh, computing the dot product of them. Um, so that was basically, you know, storing a lot of data, then reading it back in again, and the result is just a scalar. Um, so changing that so that it actually computed the, the dot products as it went along, rather than storing them and, and, and using a dot product routine. Um, so uh, a bunch of different optimizations like that. Um, it was it was absolutely spectacular. We got about a four times performance improvement on. Uh, not just on that, not, uh, and uh, it happened that that, that was the main uh, the main bottleneck in the whole code. So we've got about four times performance improvement for the whole code uh, by doing that. So that that's pretty unusual, okay. Um, but uh, but there are cases where it's uh, where it's really important.
Okay, so um, to just illustrate this with some with some some uh, some real results from from the uh, chip in, in the chip that's in Archer two. Okay, so just remind just to remind ourselves, this is uh, AMD Rome processor. I'm just working within one NUMA region here. Okay, so I'm just going up to 16 cores, uh, and I, so I'm, there's no NUMA effects going on here at all. Okay, so we've got uh, per core, every core has its own level one and level two caches, and then there's this 16 megabyte uh, shared L3 cache for, for every four cores. Okay, so this, uh, so use, using the Craig compiler, uh, and basically just uh, uh, executing this loop here. Okay, so it basically just uh, computes the, the sum of the elements in an array, um, and it's parallelized with uh, with an OpenMP parallel four directive. Okay, and what I'm going to do is uh, going to repeatedly execute this this loop, so that uh, and run it for different values of n. So that, and so the repeated executions make sure that if this array A will fit in a particular level of cache, then it's going to be there. Okay, so I get over the get over the fact that the first time it's going to be a lot of cache misses, uh, and uh, what I'm interested to measure is you know, subsequent is basically measuring the subsequent performance once the data has uh, has settled down into into the caches. Okay, so what I did was okay, execute this loop and measure the speed up that I get uh, okay for different numbers of threads and varying the value of n. Okay, so going from small values of n to, to very large values of n uh, and see what happens. Okay, so end up with um, a rather complicated looking looking picture. Um, so let me uh, let me explain what I'm what what's going on here. Okay, uh, let's first explain what I'm what I'm actually plotting here. Okay, so I'm plotting the speed up of that piece of code against n, the number of loop iterations. Okay, which goes from starts at a thousand iterations and goes up to one hundred million. Okay. Uh, so then I get, uh, and then I do that for different numbers of threads. Okay, so I get a, a, a line on the graph for, for, for every different number of threads. So the blue line is for two threads. Okay, and you can see, in fact, for, for the blue line and for all the lines for small values of n, the speed up is much, much less than one. So that means that the parallel code is much slower than the original sequential version. Uh, what's going on here? Okay, well, this is the this is death by synchronization. Okay, so this is essentially the cost of the the cost of the barrier at the end of the parallel region uh, completely overwhelms any any benefit that I get. So I actually need to get up to order of in this case, you know, for two threads, uh, and it goes up as the as the number of threads increases, but I, you know, I need to get up to you know, tens of thousands uh, of iterations before I even break even. Okay, um, and that's because, well, the compiler, you know, it was compiled with full optimization, so that loop, uh, that loop optimizes really well. It, it all, vect all the loads vectorize. It's, it, it's, um, the, the computation is very efficient. Um, and you know, if the if the data is if the array is small, then it all fits in level one cache, and uh, and it's all very very quick. So I need a lot of iterations before I even break even because of the synchronization overheads. Okay, but then for two threads, okay, once I get past that, then the speed up reaches a factor of two. Okay, it's kind of what you expect, uh, and it stays there no matter how big the the array gets. I go to four threads, then okay, it, the speed up gradually increases. Okay, so the orange line gradually increases. I do actually hit the value of four at one point, um, but then it starts to decrease a bit. Okay, 
So at this point, what's happening is that the data no longer fits in the level one or level two caches. So at this point in this region here, the data is, 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 uh, is resident in the level three cache. And there I've got four threads running on the four cores attached to one level three cache. Uh, and therefore I'm getting some contention for the bandwidth into the, into the level three cache. Okay, so it cannot, the level three cache cannot actually support all four cores, uh, you know, cannot serve data to all four cores um, fast enough here. And eventually I run out of level three cache when the array gets big enough and the speed up drops to a factor which is actually only just a bit more than two. Okay, so now I am contending for, for memory bandwidth. And this, uh, the empty row processor is particularly bad for this. Okay, so you can see that you can, you know, you can, you, know, you can, uh, you know, anything, anything more than two cores, pretty much, uh, you know, four cores is enough to saturate the memory bandwidth out of the 16 that are attached to that new region. For eight threads, okay, well, I never actually reach at this point, never actually reach H times speed up before I get into the L3 bandwidth contention problem. But then I get this sudden jump in speed up. And this is because now I'm running on eight threads, I'm running on eight cores, I have two L3 caches available. Okay. So for a, in a narrow band here, the data will fit into two L3 caches uh, running on eight threads, but it won't fit into one L3 cache when I'm running sequentially. So I get a super linear speed up here. Okay. Um, so that's what's going on there. Uh, and the same thing happens for 16 threads. Okay. So now uh, there's a, and it's a slightly wider band here because now I've got for 16 threads, I now have four L3, uh, four L3 caches available. So I have uh, this time four times the, the amount of L3 available. But no matter, eventually when I run out of L3, I'm back into memory bandwidth territory here. And uh, this basically see, okay, see, see a little bit better than, than two times speed up, but, but not very much. Okay, so, um, you know, it's possible for, you know, uh, you, you, it's the you know, contention from, from memory bandwidth is, is really bad on this chip. Um, on the other hand, you, you know, you can look at it the other way around and you say, well, actually what's really going on is that, okay, well, actually one core is able to get almost half the available memory bandwidth from the NEMO region. So you, you can look at it either way, but it, um, but, uh, it, it basically means that your, your, your scalability looks terrible. Or, uh, when you've got uh, memory bandwidth heavy threads or processes running in the in the same NEMA region. Okay, um, so yeah, what else? Yeah, okay, so we can also contend for for cache space. Okay, already already looks at that. Um, one thing we're aware of, we'll look at this afternoon, is the idea of uh, you know of uh, blocking for. Uh, doing loop blocking for cache reuse and um, so you have to basically you know, if you're doing that then you have to be aware of tuning the block sizes for a single thread and then running multi-thread code because then you know you, if you if you've tuned the if you've tuned the block size for for your for a six for a single thread then every thread's going to try and use the whole cache and then when you run more than one thread there's, there's less cache available I know we already talked a bit about SMT last uh, uh, yesterday, um, so hardware threads. Um, so yeah, if the if you're running hardware threads on the same core, it can tend for the functional units as well as uh, as well as your cache space and memory bandwidth. Okay, so hardware threads tend to only really benefit codes where threads are idle because they're waiting on memory references. Okay, um, and they're not saturating the memory bandwidth. So that tends to be, you know, codes with, you know, non-contiguous or sort of pseudo-random random looking memory access patterns, um, you know, so 
codes which are bandwidth hungry or which saturate floating point units will probably don't benefit from uh, from using multiple hardware threads and, and actually may run it actually may run slower because of the additional contention. Okay. And the other way we can um, get into hardware resource contention is by oversubscribing. Okay. So running more threads than uh, hardware execution units, be they cores or hardware threads, is generally a bad idea. What happens is that the operating system tries to give each thread a fair share of the, of the execution units. Um, so it's constantly stopping one thread running and, and starting another. Uh, so the cost of doing that is in, in the operating system is high. Um, so it's you know, thousands of clock cycles. And as we talked about earlier, it also, it also destroys your, your, your data locality. So we almost, almost never want to be in the situation where, where we're running um, more threads than we have uh, physical cores. Uh, but there's usually not very much to stop you doing it. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, you can, uh, you, you, you can always change the, you know, it's always possible to change the number of threads, even from inside an OpenMP program, just to ask for more threads. Um, and uh, it's, it's not going to stop your program running, um, but it may, may destroy the performance. Okay. Uh, any, any questions about, about that bit? Okay, so on to the six and a half evil, which is compiler non-optimization. Okay, um, <clears throat> thankfully these days this this happens pretty infrequently, but just to be aware that it that it might. Okay, um, very occasionally adding OpenMP directives can inhibit the compiler from performing some sequential optimizations. And the symptom that you will see here is that if you run the parallel code on one thread, has uh, will have a longer execution time than running the sequential code compiled without OpenMP. If this happens, well, it's a bit of it's a bit of a problem because it can be really hard to uh, to find find a workaround for it. Um, you can sometimes be cured by you know, making shared data private or making, cop making private copies of shared data can help sometimes or making local copies of variables inside routines. Um, um, very often the compiler is failing to optimize because it doesn't, it's having to make worst case assumptions about the way that uh, <clears throat> things like global variables or uh, variables passed into passed in through the argument list to um, to functions are, are being act, are being used elsewhere so the compiler has to make conservative estimates if it if it's uh, if it's working on local copies of variables then it then it knows then it knows everything about them if you or it knows their scope um, so sometimes things like that can help uh, you know, I've, uh, uh, I saw a weird one recently which was a, a, a Fortran program and you know, Normally, when you pass arrays, pass whole arrays around in Fortran, you just pass the um, the you just pass the array name, okay, and rather than the index of the first element. But uh, this particular code did it differently, okay. So it was passing the was, instead of passing the array name, it was actually passing the uh, the uh, the first element, which in Fortran does the same thing, okay. Because uh, it's uh, the address of both things is the same thing, um, but for some reason for the GNU compiler um, that screwed up the optimization with with OpenMP enabled, and so with the GNU compiler it, it ran you know almost it was the code was running almost tw twice as slow with OpenMP enabled on one thread than it was on on a on a, on a, on a serial thread and. Yeah, just just kind of happened to be lucky that we we sort of tweaked on to, to what what might be happening as uh, and you know just replacing the uh, just passing whole arrays fix fix the problem. So you can get weird stuff like that going on. So thankfully it happens very very rarely, 
um, but uh, just just be aware that it that it might uh, that it is a possibility and if you see this kind of symptom then you know if you're suddenly if you, you know, adding adding open mp and running on one thread makes your code much much slower uh, for some reason then then this might be what's happening okay um so what am i going to do about it okay um so you know my, so my code's not giving not not giving, giving me poor speed up and i don't know why uh, so well what do i do about it well you know, i hope that you're not going to take approach one okay a sensible approach is uh is we need to, what we need to do to make progress with optimization is to try and classify uh, and localize the sources of overhead okay so figure out, try to figure out what type of problem is it, okay? Which one of those six things is biting us uh, and where in the code is, is it happening? And if we can do that, then we give ourselves a fair chance of being able to, to fix the problem, okay? Um, so, you know, worth using, learning to use tools to help you, uh, timers, hardware counters, profiling tools, and so on. And you know, obviously, you know, as with any optimization, you know, fix the problems which are responsible for the big overheads first. Okay, so don't you know, don't spend time wait, uh, fixing small problems when there's when there's a big one still sitting there. I say I talked a bit about profilers yesterday uh, in this uh, more general context. Um, say standard profilers like GProf or what you get in your favorite IDE. Uh, can be confusing they, because they typically accumulate the time spent in functions across all the threads uh, and don't give you any other information. You can get a lot of information by, out, out of using, using timers, okay? And OpenMP has a, has, a, has a very serviceable timing routine uh, that you can use. Um, so, you know, what, what you might consider doing is, uh, you know, is adding timers around every parallel region, uh, as well as around the whole code, and then you can calculate the, uh, you know, that at least allows you to calculate this. If you run on different numbers of threads, it will allow you to calculate the speed up for every parallel region. So that should give you a good clue as to where your problems are. Okay, and yeah, okay. Don't assume that. Don't uh, because of this. Uh, prob the pos possibility of me changing memory access patterns you know, don't necessarily assume that the time spent outside of parallel regions is, is independent of the number of threads. It, it may not be. Okay, and then so in general, there's a whole bunch of, um, uh, of performance tools out there in the world. Um, so you may or may not come across, depending on what systems you're running on, uh, on Arch2, we have uh, Craypat. We also have Arm Map. Okay, except it's no longer owned by Arm; it's branded something else now. Um, I'm for for OpenMP work. I am. I'm. I really like it's. Oh, thanks. Uh, Ruiz reminded me. It's Linaro who who now own Map and and DDT tools. Okay. Um, um, for for OpenMP, I'm, I'm actually quite a fan of of, of Scalaska, If you can get it to work, okay, it's uh, it, it, it's a free tool, um, and but getting it to getting it to work with applications can be a bit of a, a bit of a trial. Um, it doesn't play nicely. It tends not to play nicely with complicated build processes. Um, and it can also be hard to control the amount of uh, amount of trace data that it produces if you're doing tracing experiments. But if you can get over that, then um, I, I find it very, very useful because it, it really does try to break down overheads into into the different categories uh, and also tell you whereabouts in the in the code that it's happening. So it's uh, I, I find it one of the one of the best tools for 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 analyzing uh, OpenMP code. Uh, OpenMP codes. The thing that none of these traditional profiling tools will do is tell you about uh, about communication issues um, to first approximation. Um, there is a thing called Thread Spotter though, which is uh, which is very good for 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 finding these kind of problems. Um, it works in a very different way. Um, it's not doing traditional pro uh, 
Sampling profiling, it's not doing tracing. Uh, it's, it's doing, well, it is doing tracing, but it's, what, it, what it actually does is it takes a statistical sample of the memory accesses in the program. Uh, and then it, um, so it doesn't dump every single memory access. It just, it just samples them. Um, so that it keeps the the interference in your program and the and the size of traces sensible, um, and then it goes and replays that through a cache simulator. Um, so that basically it um, it basically does some post post analysis on the on the on the memory access trace um, to find to to look for for cache and memory issues, and, and it's you know, it's able to detect things like false sharing, which which pretty much no other, no other tool will do. Okay, so, well, remarkably, I have just about hit my time limit. So, um, yeah, the next session will be a practical session. Um, so, this is a, uh, gonna give you is a, a, a de deliberately not very efficient uh, OpenMP version of a, uh, a little um, uh, molecular dynamics code. Um, and okay, so it's in the moldin directory in the in in the tar file that you uh, you got. Um, so if you didn't re-download the tar file um, after lunchtime yesterday, when when Adrian did those fixes to it, then I suggest you grab a grab a new copy of it. Um, it's got uh, hopefully all the the Slurm scripts fixed in it. So what I suggest you do is basically um, uh, so use use Craypat to instrument this this little code and uh, and look at the profile and we'll see what to whether it can can tell you what's you know well, what sort of overheads see if you can figure out what sort of overheads are, are causing problem in, in this code um, and then obviously if you're you know if you're feeling confident about your, your OpenMP program you can you can try and fix it. But um, are there any more questions? Great. Okay. In that case, um, I'm going to take a break. I'll be back at 11:30, but then it's a practical session up to up till lunch. So I'll be around between from from 11:30 to 12:30 and uh, uh, able to answer any questions. And then I'll also talk through the example just before just before lunchtime. Okay. Thanks, folks. I'll speak to you later. Ah, okay, I think that's better. Um, okay, just before lunch, I was just going to um, talk through this example, this practical exercise a little bit. Um, so um, this is the output from Craypat for running this little molecular dynamics example on four threads. Okay, so this is the this is the output from Pat report. So it's telling me I'm running uh, one MPI rank. Well, it's not really one MPI rank; it's just one process, um, uh, and four threads per four threads per process. Okay. So here I get the uh, the profile. So it tells me that uh, the time spent is 100%, 100 uh, so 100% of the time is, is the total, which counts for 21.9 seconds. And of those 21.9 seconds, 50% is spent in the OpenMP runtime library. And it's telling me that most of that time is in OMP set lock, 
and OMP unset lock. And that's somewhat unhelpful because I don't have any explicit calls to set lock or unset lock in the code. Uh, this is actually coming from, these are calls which are generated by the runtime to implement the critical section. Um, but you kind of just have to know that. Uh, so that's not particularly useful. Um, but once you know, once you appreciate that, you can say, okay, there's a lot of overhead coming from, uh, there's a lot of time spent trying to enter the, the critical section here. And then just under half the time, the 48.4% of the time is in the actual user code. And that's almost entirely coming from the, uh, the body of the parallel loop. So this mangled, this forces underscore dot loop at line 23 says, okay, this is, uh, that what that means is this is a, uh, this is a routine that the compiler generates to implement the parallel loop. Uh, it's at line, it's starting at line 23 in, in uh, file, in function forces. So that tells me that half the time is spent actually executing useful code and the other half is waiting for critical regions. But even of that, it says that, okay, it also tells me the imbalance time here. So this is basically saying out of these 10 and a half seconds, this is the maximum minus the average time was four and a half seconds. So this is telling me that different threads are spending different amounts of time executing the, the, uh, the in the parallel loop. Okay, and that also becomes a bit clearer if we look further down the file. There's a, uh, there's a table which is load imbalance by thread. Okay. Um, so this is telling me that, uh, so this is not, this is for, for everything in the code. So that's not necessarily very helpful, but it's, it's clear from this, that, uh, that some threads are, are spending much more time doing stuff than, than others. Um, but it doesn't really tell me where that's happening. Okay. So, um, it's, so Craypat is a, a little cryptic. Um, but if I stare hard enough at this, I can convince myself that there are actually two problems with this code. One is the critical region is a bottleneck. It's a code spending a lot of time. I got a lot of idle thread time waiting to enter the, uh, enter the critical region. And we've also got load imbalance as well. So what can we do to the code? So if we, oh, let's have some color. So the load imbalance is fairly easy to fix here. We can add a schedule clause to the parallel do. Um, pretty much anything sensible will do here. So um, even even static one will 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 solve this problem. We'll solve the load balance problem quite well. And then the critical regions, which are down here. Um, which are protecting the updates to this array F. So these are basically, we can replace, well, one thing we can do is replace the critical region with three atomic directives to do these updates. Okay, so these are just elements of an array of doubles. So uh, using, using an atomic directive to do the updates is, is, is fine and that'll perform much better. Uh, other possible solution is instead of declaring F as a shared array on the parallel region up here, we can actually uh, we can actually include it in a reduction clause. So it's possible to op OpenMP supports uh, reductions on arrays. So that what that's doing is uh, giving every thread a private copy of the whole of the F array. Uh, and then adding them together, adding those copies together element-wise, 
um, to give the to give the final one, and that's so that's an, that's another possible solution to this one, which which will also perform quite well if you if you try it out. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so what else I can do is show you the what Scalaska does with this. Um, so it's a little bit nicer in, in some ways. So this is Scalaska's cube GUI. Uh, which hey, so takes takes a bit of getting and um, getting used to uh, and under, understanding. Um, and if you're interested, there is uh, we uh, there was a course on Scalaska given recently. Um, so all the materials are are available on the Archer Training uh, website. So uh, and I'll I'll post the link to that in the chat in a minute um but okay what can we see so uh, what's this okay i need to explain a little bit what the goes here so there's three columns here um so the, the left hand column as allows us to choose the metric that we're interested in so i'm interested in in time here the middle column shows the call tree so in in the code okay so See if I uh, if I fold it up, then it, it shows to begin with it just shows everything in, in MD, and then as I un, as I unfold it, uh, you can see okay it says that um, you can see that okay everything is spent all all the time is so it colors you know things where where all the time is spent are colored red, and things where nothing is spent are colored blue and and then sort of rainbow colors in between. Uh, so it's, it tells me it's spending all the time in the uh, parallel region in forces at line 20, forces.f90 at line 20. And then I can look inside that as well. Again, it says, okay, that's uh, most, some of that's in the, in the actual parallel loop. And then it splits it down into time in the, so this is uh time in the in the critical entering the critical one of the critical regions because it, it distinguishes between there there are two critical blocks in the code so it says there's a lot of time in the uh in the line one at the the one at line 58 in the inner loop okay um so it tells me that uh, that there's a, a bit of time actually executing the critical block but there's a lot of time uh entering uh, entering and exiting it here uh, and then it also tells me there's also quite a lot of time waiting at the at the barrier at the at the end of the loop. Okay. And the the right hand panel here gives gives me this uh, the the machine view, so it tells me so when I when I click on one of these categories, it tells me how those how that time is distributed across the threads. So I can see so for the actual computation here. You can. It's uh, it's it's quite clear to see that there is there is load imbalance. Okay, so the the master thread thread zero is spending the longest time doing the actual computation, and uh, and thread 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 seven the least amount of time. And then you can also see in the barrier as well that different threads spend different amount of times waiting in in, in the barrier at the end so that's also an indication that uh, of, of the of the load imbalance that's going on here um, so in some ways that's uh, uh, 
rather easier to 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 understand and 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 uh, and navigate. Um, tool uh, the the Cray pad. Um, so Scholastica is not not official. Scholastica is available on the system. It's not, but it's not officially supported and uh, and and documented. But uh, uh, so say the. Um, there was a course run on it. There was a, there was a run of the course fairly recently. Um, so let me just find the link for that. Yeah, thanks, Ruby. Yeah, so great, thank you, Ray. That's the that's the link for the uh, for the Scholastica training material. So there's uh, everything available there if you say so. It it does you know it, as as with all these tools it it uh, you know it, it takes a bit of time and effort to 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 learn how to use them, um, but if you are interested, the 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 material is there. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions before we uh, before we finish up for lunch? No, in that case, we'll take our lunch break and we'll resume again at 1.30.